Hey, it's Mike. Thanks for tuning back in. Sunday morning, I'm going to do my weekly Clearing the Bases episode here. Clearing the Bases is um, I just clear my browser tabs of things that I found interesting, but they didn't amount to their own videos. So let's jump right in. I have this, uh, I, I showed this item. Where, where is it here? Uh, okay, see original listing. I did a video on this card a couple of weeks ago when it was still going and it sold for $2,020. It's the 1995 Columbus Clippers yearbook card, PSA 9. It is insanely rare, as they say. I'm a little surprised it only sold for $2,000, but uh, still very cool. I also did a video on this card. Why? I set these up. Why is it going backwards? This is um, the 1977 Ricky Henderson Frank Chong minor league team set. It's, well, it's the Frank Chong minor league team set featuring Ricky Henderson. And the Ricky Henderson is right here in the middle looking sharp. And uh, Brent, who is a Ricky Henderson expert, super collector felt it would go for four or five thousand dollars it sold for eighty three hundred dollars and in the ricky henderson collecting group he's in nobody fessed up to buying it and nobody knows who bought it so they're uh very interested to see he's got his eye on the pop report i'm sure to to see if it grades either with uh, psa or wherever else it might grade with and what it grades out as. It looks off-center to me, but I also don't know what this card normally looks like. But yeah, he was thinking it would go for four or five thousand dollars. Went for just about double that. It's a pretty cool, cool card. Very rare card. Uh, Chasing Cardboard shared this on on uh, Twitter. This is not one of Chasing Cardboard's cards. Just that they were disappointed in it, and I get it. I'm not a football collector but i am an autograph collector and this is a one of one as you see right there and it's a sticker auto why wow, that should be this should be laws against sticker autos on one of ones and then to make matters worse this patch which is a laundry tag is not from any specific game or event i don't know what do you guys think about that one of ones feels like they should be a little bit more meaningful to me. Saw this. And again, uh, I follow Heritage Auctions on Twitter because they're they're so good at social media. I'll never buy anything from Heritage Auctions. It's all way too expensive, but they have really cool items and they always feature them on, the, on their Twitter. Uh, this is one. When does this feel? 14 days left. PSA 1 with an auto 10 mantle currently with buyer's premium over $200,000. This was a disappointing potential attic find. Uh, and I know the US Sun is probably some uh, tabloid, but uh, I, <clears throat> I use a news service that just recommends news to me based on my interests. And of course, I'm interested in big finds. And this one says, my, it's touchdown. My $5 thrift store sports jersey turned out to be worth $1.2 million on eBay. It pays to do your homework. And I was like, ooh, I could do a thrift store video. And it's an old Peyton Manning jersey. So I'm thinking like a game used, autographed, specific game. Uh, and TikTok creator focuses on finding hard to find, blah, 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 blah. And there it is. I went and I watched the TikTok video and it says, assumed such, pri such a fi prized fine would go for at least $30. To his delighted surprise, the Icons jersey was just $5. And that was just the beginning of his excitement. Okay, so here we go. Here's where the $1.2 million comes from. A quick search of eBay revealed that Peyton Manning jerseys can sell for a wide variety of sums. What a surprise. And almost, all of them are larger than $5. He even quickly displayed one jersey that took home a whopping $1.5 million. 
Similar jerseys regularly sell for $30 or more on eBay. But that's it. That's it. And nowhere does it mention $1.2 million. It doesn't mention the value of this one. There's nothing that made it special, just that he bought it for $5 and it was worth $30. Ah. This was on Hobby News Daily. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. I follow Nat Turner on Twitter as well, and he kind of teased this purchase of a 1954 Topps box by saying it was his best, biggest purchase ever. And then uh, Ken Golden jumped in and said, next you'll need the 1952 Topps. But he finally revealed, and I don't know who Jason is, but he did a really nice job of this article. Uh, 1954 tops that Nat Turner purchased at the National. Nat Turner being collector's CEO, head of PSA, whatever. 1954 tops box and a BBC E seal. And then he debates, Jason debates whether to rip it or uh, flip it. Or you could just keep it, I guess, is the third option. I don't think he mentioned that, but yeah, I think that's what Nat, Nat plans on doing. But Jason does a nice job of breaking down the series. Uh, I don't know if you could tell which series it was. I don't remember. But anyway, this is just a good article about you know who's in each series and then what the values are of each of the cards. So pretty cool. I wish I, I I wish I could afford an empty 1954 Topps box. I would love to have that for my collection. And here's Sports Collectors Daily, and that's me. I was in a Sports Collectors Daily photo. This is at the YouTube get together. Um, talking to Stephen, and I don't I, I don't remember who this is. So if you're watching, I'm sorry. You can let me know in comments. And there's Mike. And then here's Dr. Beckett, and oh, there I am again, talking to Geary, nice gentleman I met there. So, I thought that was cool. Five individuals, including a local probate judge, charged for roles in stealing valuable sports cards and firearms collections from a state. Uh, they, uh, Collections of sports cards with an estimated value of more than $1 million and firearms worth more than $100,000. Uh, and then down here gives the little details. It is alleged to the following day, let me see here, the day of Mr. Barbieri's passing, her daughter and boyfriend conducted internet searches regarding market rates for sports cards contained in the collection and the following day, they unlawfully removed sports cards and other items from the estate, and they later sold a portion of the collection, sought buyers for the collection, and transported the goods to a, sport, a storage unit for later sale. I wish they would say <laughs> what these cards were. Uh, this guy, Chris Torres of Seattle, this is also Sports Collectors Daily, tattooed Polar Bear Tito six cards on his arm. And this article is good. It tells why he did it and stuff. And it gives a lot of photos. But here's some close-ups. Ray Demet, Frank Chance, Bill O'Hara. And then there's the Frank Chance close-up. And then you've got Christy Mathewson. And here's some more. That's very cool. The art is amazing. Oh, and then they've got other collectors with tattoos. There's Ty Cobb. Yeah, neat. <clears throat> I did a video a few weeks ago, or at least it was featured in one of these clearing the bases about a sealed first generation iPhone that sold for $190,000. And now a sealed first gen iPod from 2001 sold for $29,000. This was bought as a Christmas gift in 2001. These sold for $399 at the time. I thought that was cool. And then I saw this 
Ultra rare Apple sneakers. I don't remember Apple sneakers. Yeah. It's a very, very old Apple logo. Custom-made sneakers for Apple employees from the mid-90s. Huh. Okay. And then Panini is suing uh, Fanatics, which you've probably already heard about this before. Paul Lesko did a little breakdown of it on Twitter. Paul Lesko is the hobby attorney. Uh, the most interesting thing, and I agree with Paul, the funniest thing about this is that they say the most Panini can do now because of Fanatics, what they allege, Fanatics anti-competitive practices are that they create pajama cards that brush out all league marks, generally resulting in low quality cards depicting players seemingly in pajamas. And this is exactly what they do for baseball and other sports that they don't have the license for right now. So they're calling their own cards low quality. Hmm. Interesting. Also, Panini had the same exact exclusive contracts for basketball and football for the last 15, 14 years, 15 years. And so are they saying that they were anti-competitive during that time? I don't know. Uh, Jason Vass, I did an interview with Jason where he gave a tour of his basement with all of his Ken Griffey Jr. cards, 125,000 of them. Here are some better pictures of that room. It's just amazing. I love the, like, the Wheaties boxes. Someday I want to have a, a museum like this in my house. Here are all of his library uh, cat, like, you know, cataloging systems for cards. It's awesome. Yeah, he was explaining to me that this was 880 pounds empty, but it's full and usable now. Very cool, very cool. And then just a couple of oddballs and heritage auctions, this down marker from the 1930s. Very cool. And then a slabbed castle gray skull. This was at the National, too, and I just missed it. Slabbed Castle Gray Skull. You can see that looks like it was priced at $50 at the time. I had this as a kid. It was one of my favorite toys for a long time. So that's it. Quick one. I guess it's not quick. It always feels like it's going to be quick, and then it ends up being... 12 to 15 minutes. Let me know what your favorite one was in the comments. I appreciate you guys watching. Have a great Sunday.